Hi, welcome. I'm Melissa Nielsen with Waldorf Essentials and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Um, before I get started, um, I want to tell you to go ahead and get a pen and a piece of paper. I want you to be able to take notes. Um, I think that this is going to be a great webinar for those of you who know us and for those of you who are brand new to us. I think that you will find um, a lot of, um, hopefully, a lot of things that you can put into action right now. And, um, and we're also going to talk about some products that we have that um, really will help you on your journey. So I want you to get a pen and a piece of paper and sort of get that while I am just introducing myself. So for those of you who know me, um, this is going to just be review. If you don't know me, um, I'm a homeschooling mom of five and um, I've been homeschooling for a lot of years. I've been working with families for just over 10 years consistently as a consultant. Um, my oldest is 20 and we Waldorf homeschooled all the way through the grades with him and um, my second one is 18 and he actually went to public school when he was um, a sophomore in high school and um, the things we did at home translated great in fact he sent me a message he's just getting ready to graduate and so he's having those final conversations with counselors and stuff and he sent me a message the other day he's like mom I only needed two classes this semester I said how did that happen? He said, all of the stuff you you turned in on my transcript, all counted, and then some. So he was super excited because he only needed two classes his last semester. So what senior in high school does only want two classes? Um, he was like way impressed. I said, oh, so you finally have a really good testimony of homeschooling. He's like, yeah, I do. So um, so that's my son that's um, just become an adult. Um, my I have a 16-year-old daughter that lives at home with us, and I have a 10-year-old son, almost 11, and a five-year-old daughter, almost six. So at home this year, we are, in the year we're in, we are um, K-1, we are um, K-1, fourth grade, and 10th grade. So today we're really going to be focusing on getting you out of struggle and into peace. And, um, you know, I've talked a lot. I don't know if, if you've not seen our journal that I've talked about. Um, it's called Planning for Peace, and for some reason it's mirrored. I'm not sure why. I Somehow, I asked my husband about that this morning. I have no idea why it's backwards, but anyway, it's called Planning for Peace. And the reason why I think you should really highly consider this journal is because it go takes you through every single step that I have done mm -hmm. in my homeschooling. And I've done a lot of planning things in the past, and I've, I've shared what I thought was everything, but then I realized... I realized over the last year that there are things that I do that I must not have really been sharing or that I must have been, um, you know, missing because there are still steps that are missing from, um, you know, sort of what people are telling me they're doing. But there's steps that we end up doing together when I consult with people. So really what I've done is I've taken a lot of the things that we end up doing when we have a consult and I put them in a planner. Um, and and I'm, I'm sort of really making you look at those things. So we're going to today go through a, f a few of them. So that's why I said I want you to have a pen and a piece of paper handy because we're going to do something that I, I find incredibly important. Um, and we're going to first work on ranking how you feel about certain key areas of your life. And, um, and I'm going to grab a sip of my tea. Hold on one second or I'm going to lose my voice. And we don't want that to happen. So uh, I want you to get your pen and paper out. If you have your journal already and um, you are already part of the Planning for Peace program, we're just going to be working through some of the one th month one stuff. So you can, if you don't have your um, hard copy in your hands, you can print off these forms. Actually, you can just pull down the, the digital copy of it. So I want you to rank from 1 to 10. One being, I feel really crappy about this. Ten being, I'm doing pretty dang good at this. And this is just a snapshot in time for right now. This is not a, the, you know, I, I want you to evaluate because so much of what we do and what makes us successful is looking at where we've been. That doesn't mean we have to be mired in it. That doesn't mean we have to dwell on it. It means we have to look at it and go, okay, this is where I've been. This is where I want to go. I have to figure out sort of how I'm feeling about where I've been 
in order to know where I want to go. And that's a key step that is missing. If you are really struggling, I'm going to submit that that's a key step that's missing in what you're doing. If you are really struggling about having peace in your home, you are not doing enough of observing. You are just trying to put Band-Aids on things. And I am not about Band-Aids. I am about healing. Band-Aids are great to cover things up, but we need to work on healing homes. And a lot of our other work, um, you know, we do a ton of work with Waldorf, but a lot of our other work is all about parenting. And so if you're new to us, you know, we work on, we work on how, how to parent, you know, there, we, a lot of parents come to Waldorf and they are, they're attachment parents. And so they think that Waldorf is this great, like segue into that, into like a depth of that. But here's what happens. Um, attachment parenting, and I've been an attached parent for 20 years, more than 20 years. Attachment parenting is amazing. But you have to adapt as your kids adapt. So if you don't, if you don't grow as they grow, and you're still trying to parent a ten-year-old like they're a five-year-old, it will not work. So you have to adapt as they grow, and you have to continually evaluate, evaluate yourself. You have to be doing a good deal of inner work, and we talk about that in all of our programs. We talk about that a lot in our Planning for Peace journal. Um, it's so important to your own health. For not just yourself and your homeschool, but your marriage um, or any partnership you're in, um, even if you're a single mom, because I was a single mom for a time, um, all of those things, you have to really have the ability to um, really look at where you're at. And then, and then you have to be willing to make change. I mean, because that's looking at where you're at and then not doing anything about it, that's sort of, um, and then just whining about it, that's sort of an unhealthy way to look at things. But you, you look at these things and then you have to make a plan from there. So if you've got your pen and paper ready, we're going to start ranking. Remember, one being, I did, you would really, in order to have a one, you would have to have done nothing. Um, oh yeah, I wanted this to be a goal, but I didn't do one thing about it. That would be a one. Um, ten would be, again, I rocked this. I'm continually working in this. I feel really good about it. I rank very few things ten. Only because I always feel, and I'm, you know, I'm cleric, so it's just how I'm, that's just how I'm wired. I always feel like I can do better at something. And so most of the time, the highest I will rank something is an eight, sometimes a nine. But I always feel like there's room for improvement on things. And so that's sort of where I'm coming from. Different temperaments will rank differently. But really, I, like I said, the only way you would be a one is if you did nothing. So, all right, first one. This is your personal rhythm. Rank it from one to 10. Um, next would be your family rhythm. Um, holding the space. How are you holding the space? Sorry, I'm turning my page here. And you don't have to write anything next to it right now. I just want you to rank it and write down what, so write down rhythm, personal, and then number, because you're gonna go back to these later. And, and, and later, you're going to spend some time with them. Um, the next thing I want you to rank is um, your planning. Then rank your main lessons. Rank your art, handwork, and music. Again, that's relating to the curriculum. Rank your confidence from 1 to 10. Rank your personal growth. Rank your physical health. Rank your relationship with source or God, the great spaghetti bowl, whatever it is that you want to call it. Relate, rank your relationship with your partner and rank your relationship with your kids. So this is, a, this is an exercise that I do on a regular basis because it tells me a lot. It tells me a lot. When I, when I sit down and I look at those key areas, and you might have other key areas that are in addition to this. These are the key areas that I see come up again and again and again when I work with homeschooling families. And um, I work with hundreds of families a year. Um, these, are the, these are the things that tend to come up most often. And these are the things that, that I tend to rank most often in my life. Like how, you know, and, and, and you could maybe, so I'm going to give you some examples because I don't want you to feel bad about things. So like my relationship with Source, I continually rank around six or seven because I feel like I'm doing good at it. But I'm continually wanting to do more. Like, who doesn't want to know more about God? <laughs> like, I would, I could walk down that path all day long. So, you know, I, I'm in continual 
um, looking for better depth and for better connection for myself. Relationship with my partner. Eric and I have an amazing relationship, amazing marriage, but I still only rank it like an eight. Why? Because we're not, I, there are always things that I know I can improve about myself. And I know he would rank it about an eight too. So it's not that we feel badly about where we're at. It's like, okay, well, we're doing really good, but we'd really like to do like even better than that. Um, my relationship with my kids, I consistently rank about a seven or an eight because in general, all five, I have five people I have to think about in general that, you know, and I'm thinking when I'm doing this ranking, I'm ranking all of my relationship with all of them together. But then I also sort of go back through and I rank each one of them separately. I go, all right, how's my relationship with Harry? It's really good right now because he lives in Colorado. <laughs> So he's not here at home, but he's coming home in September. He's serving a mission for our church and he's done in September. And um, he said to me the other day, Mom, um, I know I'd like to get a job and um, move out as quickly as possible. And I said, Oh, son, I think we'll have an apartment ready for you when you get home. <laughs> because I love him dearly, but I don't think we're going to lift a ranking. So like I said, I would rank my, my relationship with Harry really high right now. My relationship with my 16-year-old daughter, um, she, we have a really good relationship. My gosh, there are those hormones that get in her way, and then those hormones get in my way. Um, so I'm continually looking for ways to open communication with her. And for me, um, a lot of that is spent on my knees, like asking God for help. Like I, I, want, I want to be the support that she needs, and that, so that changes. My relationship with my 5-year-old, she's got SPD. And so um, those of you who have kids with special needs, you know it's really easy to sort of put a little block up. And I'm continually working to not have that block there. So I do things daily that make me connect with her because it's very easy. You know, having I have two, my oldest has special needs and she's got special needs. Whew, it's really easy when you're a mom with special needs to find ways to sort of block that child yeah you have to parent them but it's it's natural to go okay but I can't be in that emotional space so I have to force myself so if you're in a place where you've got children with special needs and you're really struggling with connecting with them you got to find ways to connect with them because that's that's part of this whole big thing if you're struggling you're struggling for for certain reasons and you've got to figure out how to navigate those reasons so um, I want you to really take the time um, to, and of course we're just going to walk through them quickly here, but I, that's why I wanted you to write them down and to take notes because I want you to spend some time thinking about these things later. So if you rated your planning a three, I want you to ask yourself why. Did you not do um, the depth of planning that you needed to? Did you not, um, you know, continual, continually go through? Did you, I have a lot of parents that say, well, I didn't even read the curriculum from beginning to end. I go, what? You need to read it from page one to the end. Every time you get a new curriculum, all of it, all the lessons. You, you read it for different reasons. The first time you read it through to understand everything that's there. The second time you read it through to start with your planning mind. And you, you've got to have time to do that. You can't do that all cramming. So you have to take the time. So, you know, so much of this process and, and the reason why I created the journal was so that you would take the time to plan and the journal spread out over five months. So you, you start now and, and you, you will be ready for the fall. So if you live on the other end of the world and your school year doesn't start till next January or you haven't done any planning and it started last January, get busy. Um, these are things that you should do on a regular basis. I continually rank where I'm at with these with these um, key areas because I want I want to know especially if I'm feeling off if I'm feeling off and, and I can't put my finger on it I'll sit down and go through these and go all right where, where is it that I'm feeling off is it something in my planning I'm feeling off is it something that has nothing to really do with homeschool but has everything to do with um, you know me and the kids outside of homeschool or is it just about me because gosh moms guess what a lot of times it's about us um, and there's something we're struggling with. Maybe, maybe somebody knocked you down in your confidence and you're having a hard time getting back up. Or maybe you are going through a divorce and that is, um, that's really hard. You know, I've been there. That is like, that's probably the hardest thing I ever did was get a divorce. Um, and, and it was harder than what came after. I mean, I, 
I've been divorced for 13 years and back into court. I, Eric, the first six, seven, eight years that Eric and I were married, we were in court <laughs> every year and we spent a crazy amount of money. And so I get it. It's hard. And, and those are the times when I started really implementing so much of the evaluation stuff because I felt like I didn't want to be constantly trying to catch up. And so when I learned how to evaluate where we were and where we'd been, what we'd actually done versus what my mind, because remember, the mind is Satan's lawyer. The heart is a servant to God. Imprint that on yourself. When your mind gets over active and out of control and you can't stop thinking about what you haven't done, it's very useful to use evaluation tools so that you're not feeling that way. So right now, if you are like having some major struggles, I feel yeah, I get it. I've been there. Um, if you are, you know, in just in the middle of the school year and you guys have been sick for a month, then the things that I'm, I'm going, going to suggest are one, you do whatever you can to get over that sickness. So I will like forego, I will pull money out of savings. I will pull money from places that whatever you have to do to get yourself the supplements you need to get better, do it. Um, and then you have to be proactive about really protecting your immunity. That's something that has been, um, about 13 years ago, I had a um, special blessing and, and um, then in the blessing, the guy said to me that I was really going to need to work on making sure that I kept my family healthy. And at the time I was like, oh, whatever. You know, I just sort of put it in the back of my head. But um, about three years after that, we had um, the swine flu. And so that was a lot of years ago. Let's see, Sam is 10. So he was like, so that was like eight years, seven, eight years ago. Um, so we had the swine flu and we had the worst case of pink eye ever. And like ever. All in the same winter. And we were so ill and so sick. And I was like, that's why. That's why that was in that blessing. And ever since then, I have done everything I possibly can to keep our immunity in check. Sorry, I'm looking at comments. And and my screen doesn't want to show them to me. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm unpinning that. There we go. Um, so, so if you're struggling with sickness, I'm going to submit to you, there are a lot of things that you can do to really work with your immune system. So we had one sick bug this, uh, this winter that just seemed to drag on. That's the first time we've really been sick as a family since we had swine flu like eight years ago. And it's because I sort of fell down on a lot of the immune stuff that I do. So there's so much you can do. So much you can do. Um, just start researching it. If you, you know, if you're a Walter family and you're struggling with sickness, just post it on your timeline. What do you guys do for immunity? And see what people do because there are so many things that you can do. There are things that after this last sickness that we had this Christmas or this winter, I was like, I ain't doing that again. I, I, I don't like to be sick. <laughs> Cholerics don't like to be sick. We don't like to be tied down. We don't, mm -mm. no ma'am. So, um, and I know nobody likes to be sick, but we get like really grouchy and really bossy. And so nobody likes it when I'm sick either. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so mom says to me, We've got spring fever here and a little lazy in our current... I understand that. I live in San Diego and it's nice hair 300 days of the year. Um, so what I do is I, um, I make sure that I take a break. And this is something I was talking to a mom about the other day. And, um, and I, I know I've talked about it in other arenas, but as you're getting ready to plan for the new year and you're sort of evaluating where you are, I take a break about every 10 days. But every 10 days in my in our schooling, there's a break in there. Mm -hmm. And and that's just a one day break. We um, you know, we might go just go to the zoo that day or we're going to the beach that day. And yeah, we go to the beach every day, but we take that day off and that's what we're doing. It's allotted to something that's not school related. When we take a break about every 10 days. Now, that means we, you know, we we don't take all the breaks that everybody else takes at Christmas and at Easter. We take some of them. Um, and we do some stuff throughout the summer, um, but, and I'll talk about that in here in a minute, but, um, I, if I don't take a break about every 10 days, then the sanguine in me starts to get really fidgety and find reasons to not do school. And I know that about myself. So if you are struggling with staying on your plan, then make sure you have enough breaks scheduled in there because the breaks are golden. And, um, and they really sort of give you that oomph to go again. Now, if you've had a lot of sickness and you don't feel like you can, um, take a lot of breaks, 
find ways to, to squeeze them in there. Take steal from other vacation times so that you can, um, you know, so that you can absolutely have that time because you need the breaks, especially when you're teaching the grades. Most importantly, when you're teaching the grades, it's important when they're little to go and have fun too. But when you have big kids, you've got to take the time to make sure that you, you know, you take a break and the kids want it too. You know, um, when they're in public school, they get, a lot of kids get like half day on Friday. I don't get half day as a parent, like ever. So, um, and they get teacher training days and teacher planning days and parent teacher conferences and you, we don't get that. So take them, take those days and, and make sure that you plan them into your plan. So when you're putting your plan together for the year, make sure that you account for those. Um, that ends up being about two of those days a month for us. And, and so, and sometimes it's one and then maybe the next month it'll be three, but we, um, you know, we make sure that we have enough days in there that we are not thinking about school so that we are really feeling good about everything. Um, okay. So hopefully you've gone through and you've done this ranking. So the other thing I'm, the other evaluation I'm going to, um, I'm going to talk to you about is usually when people, sorry, I'm looking down here, looking for the page. When people send me um, an email or drop me a PM and they ask about, you know, what, I don't know what's going on with my child, this, this, and this is happening. And, and so these are the questions that I ask. So I'm going to give you this evaluation and this is the evaluation that you should do before you ask for help, whether it be for me or just put it up on Facebook, do this evaluation first. Um, a lot of times I'm just, I'm just going to put this out there. Be really careful about asking for advice on Facebook. I know we all have some great friends, great friends that are often willing to help, but, but really and truly you are the steward over these children. So you've got to do some of this work first. So don't put it out there until you've done the work yourself. So, um, these are the, the questions that I usually ask and there's four for each child. Generally, I will say, tell me about recent outbursts and what the topics are. Tell me about their eating habits. Tell me about their sleeping habits and their academic struggles. So that would be for bigger kids, obviously. And then I, I ask them to take time to really think about those things and to really journal about those things. And, and nine times out of 10, when we're going through, when I'm talking with a client and we're going through these, we uncover it either in sleep habits, eating habits, um, you know, turmoil that's going on at home. If you've got struggles going on with say your four year old and you and your husband are fighting constantly in front of your kids, you're not getting them to bed before nine o'clock at night and you're feeding them McDonald's. Well, there's your answer. Your answer is that super simple. And, and sometimes we want to argue with ourselves and we don't want that answer to be so simple because that answer reflects on us. And we don't want it to reflect on us. We want it. It would be so much easier to just be able to put a Band-Aid over whatever's going on with four-year-old Johnny. And that's not the case. That's not how parenting works. This, this job is not like that. I had to laugh. My husband, um, my husband was, um, said he saw this meme on Facebook the other day. It was an advertisement for Kraft. He wasn't even sure how he got on the thread that showed him that. But it was something about how um, Kraft Dinner solves parenting problems. And I was like, What? No, it doesn't. That that causes parenting problems in a lot of cases. Um, so think about what you're feeding them. And, and um, you know, I know a lot of you are on special diets and you're working really hard. You, you want to make sure that you have um, alternatives for that too. You know, when we were eating, um, and I'm, I'm fairly gluten-free. I will do sourdough bread, but for the most part, I'm gluten-free. Otherwise, I pay for it. Um, I'm not, I don't have a celiac allergy, but I have, you know, like arthritis type pain that happens since my stroke, if I'm not careful about gluten. And so, um, so I understand, I understand having those things when my, when Harry was little, he was wheat free and dairy free. And so we were pretty much vegans, um, mm -hmm. for a long time. And so, um, oh, excuse me. So I understand making special meals. I understand cooking like majorly in advance. You have to plan for those things. All of those pieces don't come together smoothly if you don't make a plan for it. So, um, and I know I talk about that a lot. I know that that's sort of the hallmark of Melissa. Did you plan and how's your rhythm? 
Um, but I really think the best thing that you can do is make sure you're laying it all out. You know, you need to know what your menu is. You need to, you need to know what you're doing for school. That's how you have peace. When you have struggles, um, that are, you know, not, and I'm not talking about divorce, sickness, death in family, new baby. I'm not talking, that's not a struggle. That's a, a life event. That's, that's not a struggle. You might struggle through that life event or find it challenging, but that's not a struggle. Struggles are usually, um, you know, you're, you're, you're floundering and you're, you're trying to figure out why. That's where I'm talking to you. You need to do the evaluation pieces. You need to step back and then you need to be okay with what you're seeing because nine times out of 10, you're gonna see that it's something that you can do about something about. Even if, um, you know, because after my divorce, my problems weren't over, they were just beginning. Like I said, we, we spent eight years in litigation with my ex-husband. So we constantly had somebody else that was, that, that was trying to parent or undermine what we were doing, constantly. So um, with that, you have to figure out, you have to plan, you have to make contingency, you have to, um, like we had detox days. My kids were there almost 50% of the time. And so in order for us to have peace, we would have to have that break day would have to be that day they came back. And we had to do something connecting and fun. And, and, it, and if, I, if it, I didn't do it and I didn't initiate it, then guess what, it wouldn't happen. So it, it all comes down to you and how you're working it. So don't let that discourage you though. That just means you have choices. And choices are amazing. Choices make you an agent in your life and not an object. So utilize those choices in a good way. Um, excuse me. So, you know, I want to, I want to sort of go beyond that. If you've got questions about sort of what we've talked about so far, I really think that if you don't have the Planning for Peace journal, it's, it's an important part of um, what you're doing for the next school year. And really, even if you don't, if you're not planning for, um, even if you're not really planning for school, uh, it's an important journal for self-discovery. Um, we go through um, making a family mission statement. We go through evaluating things with your partner. We go through more evaluations with your kids. So even though it's a homeschool planning journal, um, it's a lot more than that. I want to talk about sort of support when you are on this journey. Oh wait, so I'm, I'm gonna answer some questions. Um, oh, okay, so Vidya asks, the, the first question when I was talking about the child evaluation, um, to give an example how you would work through it, of a re recent outburst. Well, what I mean by that is like I, like yesterday, and you were not at co-op yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday, um, we have co-op on Tuesdays, and Vidya is part of our, our um, San Diego co-op. And um, my kids are like always really well behaved because I hold, tend to hold the space with them usually. Yesterday, Sarai had a tantrum at co-op. And, and I found myself laughing because I thought, these moms really need to see my kids have a tantrum. They really need to see it because they do have tantrums, especially her. She's got SBD, and she just was falling apart. She, I... She wanted to go to the playground, and my rule was you gotta eat two pieces of cheese because I know if you don't get some protein in your body, then going to the playground is just gonna make you deflate and fall apart even worse than you're falling apart now. So you can fall apart about not having this piece of cheese, but you're gonna sit right here next to me and fall apart about it. And I'm gonna continue to do the things that I'm doing with the other kids, and um, and we'll just go from there. So when I say talk, look at recent outbursts. Like for for her, I would look at that. What was that recent outburst about? Well, she was she was hangry. <laughs> And she didn't want to stop and eat before, and that's what that outburst was about. So when I say look at recent outbursts, I, I want you to look at what was going on in that outburst. Um, I When I look at her outburst in specific, she didn't have a great breakfast yesterday morning. So that also then set her up for being more hungry. And we all know that um, a lot of little kids will not eat when they're hungry. They'll just get combative. And then it's a cycle. And so you have to get them slowed down to get them to eat. So in her case, when I look at that, that outburst, she didn't eat a lot. Her sleep wasn't as good the night before. So there are reasons that sort of go around. When you're looking at specific outbursts, it's easier to then answer those other questions about sleep habits and eating habits because then you are looking at specific situations instead of saying, 
Um, Soraya is always a mess. She's not always a mess. And, and that's, that's often the trap we fall into as parents. I get a lot of emails that say, well, these, these things are happening constantly and he just always seems to be up in arms. And I go, well, let's talk about recent outbursts. Spread them out. Let's look at the big picture of those recent outbursts. Talk to me about what's going on. So that's why that evaluation piece is so important. It's so important that you look at everything that's going on when um, you have struggles like that because you really want to know. It, 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 knowledge is power. Not When you know, okay, it's about sleep. And so I'm just going to say something about sleep here. If you have kids that are um, under seven and not napping and they are not going to bed until nine o'clock, shame on you. You get them to bed by 7.30. End of discussion. They need sleep. They're going to get up whatever time they get up. Some kids are going to get up early, even if they're going to bed early. Some kids are going to get up a little bit earlier. But you need to get them in bed, period. And you need to be able to be off duty. So much of what goes on in, in our um, relationships with our partners and what's going on peacefully in our house centers around sleep. Figure out the sleep piece. Um, sleep is so vitally important, even if they're napping. So if they're napping, you need to have naps that are done by about three. Otherwise, your whole evening is going to be a mess. So you want naps that are done by about three. You want movement, movement, movement. A lot of movement. A crazy amount of movement. Um, I want, like, when people say to me, how much movement? Okay, so I'm just going to tell you. We live in a condo, so we don't have a yard. And we used to have a yard, but... Now we have a better neighborhood, no yard, so we're walking constantly. We walk um, right after breakfast, about a mile. We walk at about two or three in the afternoon, about a mile. And my youngest is five. And we often walk, especially since the time change and she doesn't want to settle down at night. We walk before bed, about a mile. So I want her body moved. By the time we get home from that nighttime walk after dinner, She's often going in her pajamas for that nighttime walk. She's like crawling into bed because she needs it. So I understand hard kids and sleep. I have five children. None of them are the same. None of them. They have all been all over the place. Some of them were great sleepers. Some of them were up all night. Some of them, you know, my 16-year-old daughter struggled with, um, she had some depression struggles. And so she um, had some struggles with sleep. And so much of depression has to do with sleep. When she sleeps, she's happy. When she doesn't sleep, it, it starts to pick away at her. So you've got to really work on sleep. And, um, and it really is important from little ones all the way up. So if you're having a struggle with your sleep, then that's a really big part of um, that physical health evaluation. So, you know, when I was talking about evaluation, evaluating things from, um, sorry, I'm going to grab it, from 1 to 10, one of those was physical health. So, um... That's not where you write, I want to lose 50 pounds. That's not where you write that. I mean, yeah, that could be a goal. But like for me, my physical health, um, I had a stroke three years ago. It would be three years on the 28th of April. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, and I still have some stuff that's lingering and, and stuff that I don't want to deal with. And so I'm going to deal with it because I don't want to deal with what's going on. So I'm going to face it head on. So when I'm talking about physical health, those are the sorts of things. Are you struggling with your sleep? You need to wrestle that sleep thing to the ground. Um, and I know a lot of people will say to me, oh, well, there's all these there's all these studies that say that, you know, nomads slept at this time and they nobody sleeps all the night. and I, I'm hearing you, but here's what I'm saying to you. You have kids. You have a job as a mom. You've got to do the things that make your life peaceful or you're going to run yourself ragged. So get sleep. Ask for help. Demand help if you need to. That means if your husband is not helping or your partner is not helping, you need to say, hey buddy, you know, I cooked your dinner. I need you to watch these kids. I am tired. I need a nap. Hopefully you don't have to say it like that. But if you do, get through. You've got to, you've got to ask for help. And, um, and if he says, I can't help you, then you need to say that I'm going to hire somebody. And you do it. The, this lie that attachment parents don't hire sitters, it's a lie. You need to find somebody that, um, that ha and, and you can find somebody that has your values. Interview people and get the help you need. This is vital 
to your existence as a homeschooling mom, as an attached mom, and in order to be emotionally healthy, you need help. So get it. And um, now I'm going to sort of walk into how you can get help online with, uh, with, with homeschooling stuff. So if you're not a member um, of our Thinking, Feeling, Willing program, I'm just going to talk about that right now. Um, our Thinking, Feeling, Willing program is amazing. Um, I, I, you ask anybody who's part of it. They're going to tell you, yeah, when I work it, it's, I do really good at it. When I don't work it, <laughs> I can't do anything about it when, when moms don't work it. So, so you have to work it. You have to work the program. When you work the program, the program works. We work on getting your rhythm in a good place. Now, what do I, what do I mean by that? Because, you know, rhythm changes. Rhythm changes and you, um, you're, you have to be able to adapt with it. So you start out by learning how to set a rhythm and how to work a rhythm. And then, you know, you have to be, I can't, I'm not there. So, so you have to be the one to actually do something with the, the rhythm that we put together. And, um, in Waldorf, it's, um, everybody sort of thinks that rhythm has to do with what day you paint and what day you're baking. And, and yeah, that's about this much of it. The big picture has to do with meals, what time you're going to bed, what time you're getting up, when you're doing those main lessons, how your planning was, when you're going for walks. There's so much more to rhythm about than about when you're painting. So if you're struggling with your rhythm and you're feeling like, um, you're feeling like you're really struggling with sort of getting that piece in order, I cannot recommend our Thinking, Feeling, Willing program enough. It is an amazing program. It will teach you how to adapt as your kids adapt. Um, it also teaches you um, how to uh, really understand the Waldorf curriculum. If you are on this path and you really want to understand what it is that you're teaching your kids, because here's the thing, um, I know that it's hard to read Steiner if you've never read Steiner, because he's kind of wordy, but I'm kind of one of those weird people that really likes to read Steiner. Um, I love the, I, once you get an understanding of how he writes then, or how he spoke, because all of these are, are lectures often that some of them are writings, but a lot of them are lectures, then you sort of get a feel for him. Um, but if you are, are using the Waldorf curriculum with your kids, um, whether it be ours or whoever's, it doesn't matter, um, to really understand it is vital if you're going to be on this path. You really have to understand um, and you really have to work on those mom lessons. Um, Lauren says, are you talking about working through the mom lessons? Yes, I am. I'm talking about the mom lessons that go with Thinking, Feeling, Willing. The program is um, an amazing program that I put together a few years ago and is constantly being added to. And the mom lessons are part of that program. Um, the rest of that, that program, depending on what member, membership you have, um, includes a um, includes membership in a, a secret Facebook group with a bunch of amazing women. I think you guys are awesome, supporting each other, working the program together. Um, so, anyways, back to the mom lessons. The mom lessons are rhythm, really understanding the curriculum. And again, if you're working, if you are working with Waldorf, you need to know what the man said. So, the mom lesson two is all about understanding the curriculum. And understanding the whys. You don't, especially if you are in a situation where you're going to be challenged by Aunt Susie who thinks your kid needs to be in school, you want to be able to say something intelligent about that. <laughs> and so um, I really am a huge supporter of understanding Steiner. Um, it will change how you look at things. It will change it, it, once you understand, start to really understand Steiner's work and you start to trust it and you start to see it unfold ahead of you, then you trust it more and you go, okay, this man's onto something and you, you keep yours. You want to get more in depth and you want to see it. You want to see the fruition. you like it, 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 it builds. Um, and you're going to find things that you're like, eh, that's not for me. And you just set it aside. Um, somebody, Tanya says, can you recommend a good first read by Steiner? Um, Kingdom of Childhood tends to be the one that is a good go-to because it it seems to be some one of the easiest. The writing um, is mostly accessible, um, so that I think that that's a, a good one to start at. Um, we also have a mom lesson that's all about inner work, and um, within that inner work mom lesson, there are forty hours of inner work um, audios. 
that are from our Beacon program that we ran a few years ago. 40 hours. It's an amazing piece of work. Um, it's a huge jumping off point for really understanding yourself, your connection with source, especially if it's strained. And even if it's not, even if it's strong, it's an amazing piece. We go through learning um, all the ins and outs of form drawing. All the ins and outs of understanding your temperament and everybody else is around you. And how and why, why do you even need to know that? And why, why will it help you be a better parent? Why will it help you be a better partner? How will it help you like understand Uncle John, who's this, this weirdo? And But now you'll be able to understand, trust me, understanding temperament, once you really get it, such light bulb moments. Eric and I have the most fun at family events. We just sort of sit back and we're quiet. And we're like, especially me, you know, I'm kind of a loud person. Um, but then when I'm quiet, people are like, oh no, she's studying me again. <laughs> I am. I'm studying you. Um, so, temperament. Um, we teach you how to draw, how to paint, how to model. Um, we talk about movement a lot. We go through the festivals a lot. We're doing a new mom lesson on circle time. And it's going to include video, lots of video, lots of songs. Um, so many pieces, so many pieces that you are pulling from different places in the Waldorf world, trying to find videos on YouTube. It's all in one spot. It's all in one spot. It's an amazing program. And again, we have a lot of moms that are like, that are in the program too, that are on the support group. I'm on the support group. I'm always there to help. Um, I spend a lot of time, you know, helping families. Also, if you're new to us and you're not on the Ask Melissa group, you can join that group and ask me just about anything. Um, and I'm happy to answer it. And um, what I had for breakfast to something about the curriculum, can, it's no holds barred. So, um, but I really, I really want to encourage our Thinking, Feeling, Willing program because it's a steal of a deal. I don't want you to ever feel like you're in the struggle alone. Um, I understand what it's like, but I think that really one thing that I'd like you to do for everybody that's still listening and anybody that listens to this on the download, I want you to take that word struggle and I want you to turn it around. I want you to turn it into challenge because challenge sounds, sounds different than struggle. Struggle implies that you are really fighting for all you can. Challenge implies, hey, this is something I can do. So look at it differently. When you look at things differently, the things you look at change. And then you're not, you're not feeling the big angry feelings about them, stressed and frustrated feelings about them. So sort of step back from them a little bit. Give them some space. You know, I think that one thing that we, um, sorry, I'm going to look at another comment here. I think that um, one thing that's really important is that we have to realize whenever we talk about something, we give it energy and we sort of give it momentum. So what things do you want to have good momentum? Do you want there to be momentum in how mad you are at your neighbor or how upset you are at your partner um, or how, um, you know, how mad you are at the, the person at the grocery store that was rude to you? Do you want there to be momentum with that? Or do you want there to be momentum in peace and love? and hugs and kisses with your partner and hugs from your kids and walks and laughter. That's the momentum you want to build. So if you are in a place of really struggling, I am challenging you to turn it into a challenge or I like this, Kathy says, an opportunity to grow. Yes, ma'am, it is an opportunity to grow. I, I, I always step back and I look at what's my part in this and how can I, how can I right this minute change things? When things are going to hell in a handbasket, it's usually my fault. <laughs> I go, wait a minute. I need to fix that. Um, so you just go, all right. And I, and I have stopped mid-yell before. I have been angry and then stopped mid-yell and started laughing. And my kids are like, oh, she's so crazy. <laughs> but then we go and we, we have fun and, and we break that cycle. The only way you're going to break the cycle is to be determined to break it. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect every day. It means that you're going to be striving. It means you're going to be on this path and that you're going to do hopefully better today than you did yesterday and hopefully tomorrow will be better than today. Um, and you just have to just move right along. So I hope you all have a wonderful day.